Hey there, this is NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Glenn Weldon. There aren't as many supper clubs in the northern Midwest as there used to be. A supper club combines the family restaurant with a lodge or social organization. It's a destination for both big celebrations and everyday hanging out. They're beloved institutions in rural communities where the cocktails are strong, the food hearty and affordable, the furniture chunky and old-fashioned, and decades of cigarette smoke linger in the drapes and tablecloths. In author J. Ryan Straddle's new novel, Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club, we meet three generations of women who run one such magical place. It's tough work and it takes its toll. The family has faced down hardship and grief, and now they face an uncertain future as chain restaurants threaten their livelihood. Straddle talked to host Robin Young of NPR's Here and Now. I love authors who marinate their work in place. Wallace Stegner, the West, Alice Walker, the South, Carl Hyas in Florida, William Kennedy, upstate New York, and J. Ryan Straddle, who writes love letters to Minnesota in novels like Kitchens of the Great Midwest and The Lager Queen of Minnesota, And now, Saturday night at the Lakeside Supper Club, which no less than Roxane Gay called a perfect book. It's set in Bear Jaw Lake in Upper Minnesota. The Lakeside Supper Club offered meals that began with a free relish tray and a basket of bread with a round of brandy old fashions, then a spread of hearty cuisine with fish on Fridays, prime rib Saturdays, a round of grasshoppers for dessert. But Mariel, who's inherited the club from her grandparents, is worried about the chain homestyle places. The biggest is owned by her husband's family. He's gone rogue in marrying her. Then there's her mom, Florence, who seems determined to live in protest in the local church until they mend their relationship, all of which is delightful. But oh, if these supper club walls could talk. We go back and forth in time and find that Florence was once a little girl on the run with her mom in Depression-era 1934 Minnesota, that someone in the story may be closeted gay, that passing down legacy businesses can be like succession, and that just because you're rooting for a character and you've been chuckling about that relish tray one minute doesn't mean you won't be gasping at their indescribable loss the next. Again, the novel is Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club, and Jay Ryan Straddle is here. Jay, welcome back. Thank you so much. Uh, That was a beautiful description. (laughs) Okay, goodbye. (laughs) I'm I'm beside myself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, uh, people are, are loving, again, you taking them into this place. And right at the opening, you say through Mariel, Heaven looks a lot like Minnesota. The next best place, a type of restaurant in the upper Midwest called a supper club. Tell those who don't know what this is. What is a supper club? It's a restaurant unique to the northern Midwest, in my experience, where I'd say a guest feels more like a guest at someone's home than a customer in a transactional relationship in a restaurant. When a diner comes in, the first thing they're given is a plate of free food, like they were visiting a friend. And they're certainly not going to wave the bill under your nose after an hour. And historically, there's been live music, dancing, events, and it's the place where you can hang out with your friends outside of work or home and feel like home. Old-fashioned decor, maybe some uh, deer heads on the walls. Yeah. Um, These supper clubs are threatened by the chain. Is that actually, I mean, how much of this was you writing about what you knew in Minnesota and what is really happening in your mind? Are, Are they threatened? Yeah, the supper clubs can be threatened by chain diners, chain family-style restaurants, simply because they can be undercut on price, and that's not a small factor when it comes to weighing how to feed a family. Uh, Despite the higher quality and intimacy of a supper club, if you can feed a family for 10 or 20 or $30 less, you often make that choice. And I've seen, yeah, I've seen it happen in my own community where I grew up I'd say within 20 minutes of three supper clubs in Hastings, Minnesota, and only one of them are still around. And when the Applebee's came into Hastings, I heard some people say, without irony, we're a real town now. We have a chain restaurant that tourists will stop at. And that was unfortunate. I remember hearing that and thinking, oh no, we have such great restaurants already. But within a decade or so of that Applebee's coming in, I did see a number of Family-owned, family-run restaurants in our town and outside our town closed down. Yeah. And, boy, uh, you take on those chain (laughs) restaurants in in the novel. But early on, you signal that, yeah, these supper clubs are where everyone goes to have their special occasion. Everybody goes. And there might be a polka band. But there does seem to be an underbelly. Uh, It's hard work. 
those walls that could mm. talk uh, would gasp for air. The smell of stale mm. smoke clings. Um, one of the earlier owners of this particular supper club we learned in a casual conversation shot himself in the head. And you've got three generations of one family, Marielle, then her mother Florence, and Florence's mother Betty, all who have different thoughts about this supper club. It can be hard on a family to, to run one. Absolutely, and not every generation is enthusiastic about the process of inheriting the family business. In interviewing current and former supper club owners while researching this book, I found that, yeah, not every generation or not everyone in each subsequent generation had that enthusiasm about <laughs> running mm-hmm. a family restaurant. I wanted to capture that and tell that story too. Yeah. But Mariel does call it a place where people choose to spend the most memorable nights of their lives. And even though they're also a place you can go after a softball game or a day of fishing, that is what they are. The supper club I worked at in Prescott, Wisconsin, the Steamboat Inn, was a place where we spent our significant nights celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, graduations. And to know you can do that at a place where you know the owner, you know the manager, you know the teenage kid busting the table, that was me. (laughs) Well, so um, so this is great because you interviewed people who are actually in this life, but you were also in this life as a a busboy. How did you come, though, Jay, to write so exquisitely about women? The women are center stage. There's men who are, you know, stage left and right, but women are center stage here. And it's not as much that they have secrets, but they have full lives, like, you know, back in the 1930s that maybe their daughters, granddaughters don't even know about. Where did those stories come from? These stories come from my mom. Mm. I write to keep my mom alive. She passed away in 2005, about a year before I published my first short story. Mm. And every day I sit down to write, I think of her. And I think of writing as a conversation with her. And since she wanted to be a novelist herself and passed away before she could write that first book, I feel like I'm carrying her legacy and doing my best to honor it. So Mm -hmm. the women in my book are her. They're also a little bit me, a little bit grandmothers, but they're ultimately a conversation with her and a conversation with the sort of characters she would have written about in a place that she loved and valued. Can you give us just a little something so we can think of your mom too? Yeah, there's some real concrete moments in Saturday night that were drawn from my mom's life experience. In the 80s, when we were little kids, she worked as a waitress at Perkins, which is one of the models for Jorby's in my book, the The Midwest restaurant chain Perkins. And I was at once so proud of her for working at a cool restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But also I saw the labor that encumbered her and the exhaustion she felt when she came home, and the box full of change that she had by her bedside that collected her tips, and since the 80s, a lot of people tipped in coins. And a part of my mom's experience working at Perkins was being in a cloud of cigarette smoke for her entire shift. Mm -hmm. And it had a obviously corrosive effect on her health. So I wrote about that in the book. I wrote about the environmental factors that contribute to shortened lives of people in the service industry through my mom's experience in that. Yeah. And my mom passed away at age 54. Mm. And had she lived longer, had she not been in front of house in the 70s and 80s <laughs> when they were dens of cigarette smoke? Perhaps. So that's one very personal aspect of my mom's life and my experience and my perception of it mm. that I put in the book. But also her joy. At the end of the day, she was a voluptuary. She loved restaurants. She would have been right at the bar next to Edina Sue drinking mm. Brandy Alexander's and Seven and Sevens. And I wanted to write about that too. Since someone's life isn't just purely a tragedy or a comedy, I, when I think about my mom, try to include all of it. Certainly, my writing process for me is an extension of the grieving process. I write to help find my way through this forest with no trails that grief can be. But in doing so, I try not to let go of the fact that my mom was one of the happiest people I've ever known and enjoyed life and would have wanted a character like Mariel to enjoy her life too, whatever losses and whatever fate that character might encounter. Well, thank you. First of all, I'm so sorry for your loss, and thank you for really underscoring that. It enriches our reading. And in your afterword, you mentioned that the book is dedicated to your son, Auden, born mm. after a difficult struggle to conceive. Now, 
in the novel. Marielle and her husband, Ned, also are having difficulties conceiving. And we want to say, because this can be something that people may want to know in advance, there are miscarriages. And then there's the unbearable loss of a child, an accident. I am uh, hoping that isn't something that you had to endure. Uh, Fortunately, no. Brooke and I did um, experience miscarriages on our route to conceiving our child, but fortunately we haven't experienced the loss of a child. Every time I sit down to write a book, I think of the same three questions, and they are, what do I want to see in the world? What do I want to learn about? And what am I most afraid of? And that child loss is the answer to the third. Mm -hmm. I put in the book as a means of wrapping my head around this fear and taking it on, but also as an extension of losses of pregnancies we'd encountered. Well, we see Ned just digging in a garden for hours and, you know, just burying grief. Was that you? That's me writing this book. Yeah. Well, um, J. Ryan Straddle, uh, you're working through all sorts of grief, delivers us just a really powerful read, and, uh, you know, wish you the best with it. Thank you so much. Oh, Robin, it's, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you again. Thank you so much. It's called Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club. By the way, have you heard from people at home like, hey, we still have this club here, come. <laughs> Not yet, but I imagine I will, and I'll gladly go. Good. I'm always up for a free relish tray in a brandy old-fashioned.